Hello everyone, this is Rami Goldratt. Welcome to my, my webinar. I would like to discuss this time a very important topic that uh, occupied my father, uh, the creator of the theory of constraints in his last uh, year of his life. And the topic is management attention. Obviously, this is a very critical resource. When I speak with uh, many managers around the world of various organizations, uh, for-profit and non-for-profit, everyone agree with me that management attention is a critical resource. And when we call a resource critical, we mean basically two things. One is that we believe this resource is essential in order to achieve the organization goal. And the other meaning is that we always feel we don't have enough of it, that we need more of this resource in order to achieve the organization goal. When a resource is both essential and we don't have enough of it, we refer to it as a critical resource. And that's what hundreds of managers around the world uh, agree with me when I check with them, if management attention in their view is a critical resource. I hope you share, I assume you share the same view. And under this assumption, maybe it's worthwhile to spend the next 45 minutes to evaluate our, if we are really utilizing this critical resource, if we are really focusing it on what really matters and not wasting the, this precious and valuable resource. And that's what I would like to discuss with you. What is currently consuming our management attention? So here are just several uh, dynamics in our organizations around the world that consume management attention, and I assume you will find at least some of them somewhat uh, relevant. Consolidation of management layers has reduced middle management capacity, right? We feel we are responsible to do so many tasks and we don't have enough capacity to achieve it. We need to constantly balance pressure to achieve higher margins and higher revenues while maintaining existing operations, which has its cost and its investments. This is a growing challenge. We always feel we are, our life as managers is like a balancing act, balancing the need for a short term for stability to balance cost and investment. And on the other hand, the need to secure the company's growth, margins, profits, and revenue. The world out there is not so certain as we all know. There is high variability of cost and definitely high variability of demand for our services and products, which we need to manage. There is a demand of uh, running multiple programs, all of which have unique goals, unique missions, unique purposes that we need to synchronize, that we need to achieve. We serve many stakeholders, our shareholders, our customers, employees, suppliers, and they constantly introduce new, the government, and they constantly introduce new requirements, new ideas. They change the budget, they change the scope, and we are there in the middle, the poor manager that need to address all these challenges and get results. You know, many times when I talk to managers, we all agree that uh, yes, reality has high complexity, uncertainty and conflicts, but that's why they hired managers, right? So are we really utilizing our management attention in the right way? My father said that management attention is the ultimate constraint. The constraint is not, essentially is not a cash or market demand or a certain machine or valuable resource that we have. The constraint is our management attention, our ability to deal, to achieve results dealing with all these dynamics that consume it. So are we really utilizing it correctly? Now I would like to start from a positive perspective. And the positive is that people, essentially they want to achieve their organization goals. They want to uh, improve themselves. And you know, whenever, wherever we look, we can find how things can be done better. Wherever we focus our management attention, we can always see how we can improve things. But should we improve it? 
Are all problems worth solving? No, let's go back to the beginning of the theory of constraints. I'm sure most of you are aware of it and that's why you attend this webinar and probably you read the book, The Goal. So here's a simple uh, process. It could be a production line or any sort of process you wish. There are four stages. One can do three parts per hour, then five parts per hour, then it feeds a, a, a station that can do two parts per hour and three parts per hour. After one hour, what is the maximum throughput this process can yield? And obviously the answer is two, hour, two parts because we have a bottleneck. What will be the result if we will try to achieve, to improve, sorry, the other resources, the other stages in this, in this process? Are we going to get more throughput? No. Is it just going to be a waste of our attention? First of all, yes, but not just that. Obviously, in this case, it will be more inventory. What I would like to say is that in most of our um, organizations, this is exactly the reality. It's not so simple to notice, like in a, this simple chart, but our management attention is not necessarily focused on where it should be. And we are constantly feeling like we're chasing our own tail rather than it making a breakthrough. Management attention must be focused on what is really dictating the organization's ability to achieve more of the goal. That's where we should focus our attention. Now, we will not go too much into the discussion of what is the goal, but in the context of companies, let's just say that the goal of every organization is essentially to provide more and more value to at least three key stakeholders. Value to customers, value to shareholders, and value to employees. All of them are equal. And we need to provide more and more value. And if we are successful, one will feed the other. One will achieving success with one will provide us the base to achieve success with the other. I will, the purpose of this presentation is not to talk about the goal and what it means to provide value, but more about what we need to do in order to really exploit management attention, starting with what we need, how to tackle the dynamics that waste management attention. But nevertheless, I would like to say just a few words about providing value because that's essentially what we need to do. My father defined exceptional value in a very interesting way. He said, exceptional value is created by removing a significant limitation in a way that was not possible before. So for example, if you would like to provide more value to customers, we need to understand what significant limitations our customers have and how we can remove these limitations in a way that was not possible before. And if our management attention will be focused to understand these limitations and what we need to do to overcome it, then we will really utilize it. We will talk more about it at the last part of the presentation. Here I would just like to conclude that management attention should be focused on removing significant limitations for our stakeholders, providing exceptional value. But how do we do it? In the book, The Goal, you've probably read the most fundamental process of TOC. It's called the five focusing steps. The first step is identify the system constraint. Identify the uh, point in the system that, can really, that really dictates the throughput of the system. Step number two is decide how to exploit the system constraint. How do you get the maximum from it? Step number three, subordinate everything else to the above decision. Align everything in the system in order for you to be able to exploit the system constraint. Step number four, add system constraints, add more capacity. And step number five, do not allow inertia to become the system constraint. The constraint can move. Let's apply this process to the context of management attention. Identify the system constraint, Okay, we concluded that the management attention is the ultimate constraint. What does it mean to exploit it? We already saw it. Exploiting management attention means that we need to know where to focus in order to provide exceptional value 
for our stakeholders, customers, shareholders, and employees, removing limitations in the way that was not possible before. But I would like to focus the remaining part of the presentation, not on how to identify these limitations and what we need to do in order to overcome them to provide exceptional value, but I would like to devote it on the third stage, subordinate everything else to the above decision, because I believe that's where the real challenge lies when we talk about management attention. I say it because there are dynamics in every organization that greatly consume management attention to the point that we don't even have the time to figure out what are the limitations that we would like our company to be, dedic be dedicated to remove. And even if we do understand it, it consumes our management attention and prevents us from really building the enablers to remove these limitations for our customers, shareholders, and employees. This stage is called subordinate everything else to the above decision. What do we need to do in order to really, what do we need to stop doing, sorry, in order to align management attention, in order to provide exceptional value. We know we must focus to better exploit management attention, but how can we focus when we are so overloaded and distracted with so many pressing tasks? If we will draw a curve that shows waste to the number of assignments that we have as managers to do, we will get a shape of a U-curve. If we don't have enough assignments, number of assignments is low, then we are idle, then we don't have enough work and management attention is wasted. If we have too many assignments open, we are totally overloaded. And that's where most managers feel they are, right? In the total ex right extreme of the U-curve, totally overloaded. If that is the case, then the first step, even before we ask ourselves where to focus, the first step is to obtain, to obtain focus, is to have the courage to decide what to stop doing. What we should stop doing in order to allow ourselves to have the management attention to know where to focus. My father said that focus starts with what not to do what we should stop doing. And there are three prevalent dynamics that greatly consume management attention and bring us to be on this extreme right side of the U-curve. We call them management attention killers. And I assume you will find them somewhat relevant to your organization. And you need to ask yourself which one of these killers is really at my doorstep, this is my life, this describes my daily reality, and that's where I need to figure out what to, where to, what to stop doing. There are three such management killers, I will go over them quickly in this slide, and then we'll go one by one using an example. The first management attention killer is dealing with symptoms instead of addressing the core problem. Okay, we will go over it in a moment. The next attention killer is that we have a core conflict in our organization, and instead of solving this conflict, we live in a compromise. We keep optimizing between the extreme sides of the conflict, suffering from all the fires they create instead of solving this conflict. And the third attention killer is that we are under pressure to achieve targets, to achieve certain numbers, outputs, and instead of building the enablers to achieve these targets, because we are under such short-term and strong pressure to achieve them, we start taking distorted actions. We're more looking at uh, fishing for numbers and getting the targets rather than building the, the enablers to achieve them. So now let's go over one by one to have better clarity. Starting with attention killer number one, dealing with symptoms instead of addressing the core problem. I think this, car uh, this uh, cartoon shows the whole story, right? You see many, many symptoms that the person is suffering from, and he says, it's okay, I took a special treatment for each pain on its own. 
Okay, that's basically what this dynamic talks about. In order to illustrate it, I will use an example from, a, not from a company, but from a government operation, tackling one of the toughest problems we have in many societies, which is called intergeneration poverty, which is basically poverty that moves from one generation to the other. Now, there are multiple state initiatives that are being deployed to deal with, this, with the challenges uh, around this problem, challenges with the family, with education, employment, and crime, and welfare, trying to deal with all these uh, symptoms. And these initiatives are wonderful, and they can really achieve results, but they are dedicated, each one, to achieve a certain symptom. And the budget that is allocated keeps increasing, but it feels like the problem only grows. Allow me to generalize in a moment before we continue with this example. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you, if you feel that you are constantly trying to put up the fire, to deal with the symptoms, but the problem only grows, this is a clear indication that you are suffering from management killer number one. Basically, there is what we call a vicious cycle that works against you, and you haven't figured out yet, or reality doesn't allow you to solve this vicious cycle. And instead, you're dealing with the sim symptoms that come out of it. In order to understand it, let's continue with the example of the intergeneration poverty. So you see there, are, I put here several aspects of this, of this problem. We have the family, the education system, social services, and the business or employers. We face multiple undesirable effects in various aspects of the system. And we are under pressure to develop solutions for each pressing symptom. For example, if we start with a family, growing up in poor socioeconomic environment, second generation poverty, low pay jobs, unemployment, crime and addiction. On the education side, low graduation rate, high attention of teaching resources, frustration of failure, of course, I just take a representative uh, undesirable effects. We can add more. If we talk about the business side, lack of skilled workers, high attrition rate, need to expand outside the state. So at the same time that we have unemployment, businesses looking for uh, labor and sometimes forced to go outside the state. Social services, growing investment, at the same time growing load on the social service uh, uh, um, uh, agents, yet there is high, high frustration. What do we do? We try to develop initiatives to address and tackle these challenges out of good intention, obviously, and many of these initiatives are very good. So here are just examples, clean neighborhood, let's have kids fund to help with second generation poverty, let's give incentives to those who work, rehabilitation for crime, after school programs, adding budgets, grants, training programs, etc., etc. If these work, fine, then we, can, we are utilizing our management attention in the right way. But if we feel that the problem is only growing and we start to feel like a dog that chases his own tail, then it probably means that despite our best efforts, we are still not addressing the vicious cycle. We are still not finding the way that can take us out of this phenomena. Dealing with symptoms greatly wastes management attention. Solutions are temporary. Solutions are partial. Solutions to one aspect of the system create problems elsewhere. Instead of dealing with symptoms, we should identify the core vicious cycle and focus our attention on solving it. Let's see what is the core vicious cycle. I'll start with the top entity here. Growing up in poor socioeconomic environment leads to having less exposure to means and opportunities, to education, to less exposure to role model for success. This leads to less path for growth and ability to be self-sustained, resulting in depending on minimal welfare, in some cases prone to crime which basically means that if I grow up as a child in poor socioeconomic environment, I end up as a poor adult, and so the vicious cycle continues. 
Until we are able to solve and address this vicious cycle, we are not breaking out of the conflict. We are not utilizing our management attention. How do we know it's a core conflict? It's a core a vicious cycle because it is standing at the base of many undesirable effects. Here are all the undesirable effects we had from our previous list. If I have less exposure to means and opportunities in education, this results in high attention of teaching resources. At the same time, in low graduation rate, which results in frustration of failure. Low graduation rate will result in low paid jobs and unemployment, which will feed back our problem. Low graduation rate results in lack of skilled workers, which leads to need to expand outside the state for businesses and with high attrition rate and with crime and addiction. If we're growing in a poor socioeconomic environment, if we depend on minimal welfare, in some cases prone to crime, we get second generation poverty. Growing investment and load on social care system, leading to more frustration. And you, that's how you see the entire reality resulting from this vicious cycle. So now we know where, what we need to stop doing, where we need to focus our management attention in order to really create a breakthrough, to really feel that we are utilizing it in the right way. If we want to break out of this phenomena, we need to somehow turn the vicious cycle into a virtue cycle, somehow break this negative dynamic. Now, what you will see is that many times, many of the initiatives that are developed to deal with the symptoms are very good. And you should still do it, but you need to do it in the right framework and, and synchronize it in a holistic manner that really enable you to break the vicious cycle. Here's an example, and we're not saying that's the only solution. In one, one of the decisions we did is we said, okay, let's focus on the youth and try to break the arrow that even though they have grown in poor socioeconomic environment, we will break this arrow and enable them to have exposure to means and opportunities to education and for role model of for success. So we break this vicious cycle. We decided to create a safe and successful education and career path. So while they are learning in school, they will also learn a job. And this not necessarily means a low paying job will find businesses in the state that are willing to mentor this youth and really develop their skills while they learn in school as well. And to structure the learning and applying at work and learning so they become more and more experts in their field. We will create a mentorship program at work and within the right incentives from the government to the employers that will really make sure that they uh, bring their uh, the youth in the right way. And we will create a school system to support career development and ongoing education. Now, of course, this is just the essence of the solution and there is much more to deal with the how, how to achieve it and how to prevent negative outcomes of this solution, etc. But at least we know that we are really focusing on solving the vicious cycle. Because if we are able to do these elements of the solution and we are able to have effective opportunities, education, and role model for success, then we start turning the vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle. Individuals have learning curve and to spiral skills development and income. Families are self-dependent and less prone to crime. Families improve standard of living, and we start to the wheels start to turn to our favor, creating in desired effects, which which we will not go into now. So lesson number one, if you feel like you're a dog chasing his tail, or in other words, yes, you're trying your best dealing with the symptoms, but the problem is only growing, take a moment and understand what is the vicious cycle that you're fighting against? And are you really putting your best efforts to solve this vicious cycle? At least you will understand that until you do so, you're not exploiting your management attention. Now, how to identify the vicious cycle and how to align a solution in a holistic manner. This is a subject matter for what we call the thinking processes of TOC. And, and I hope that in one of the coming uh, TOC club lessons, you will get an opportunity to view how to use them uh, in order to 
address core problems. At this stage, I would like to move to the next part and the next attention killer where we have a core conflict in our system and instead of solving this conflict, we are playing with a, we are confronting constantly the symptoms, the symptoms of the compromise that we constantly live with. In order to illustrate it, I would like to use an example from a business this time. And the example is from a branded jewelry um, company. They make a high-end jewelry and they sell this jewelry to mom and pop stores in the US. Now, the main challenge in jewelry business, if you look at their customers, at the retailers that sell jewelry, the main challenge is that on one hand, we talk about slow moving consumer goods. Okay, this is not a toothpaste or toothbrush or food. Actually in jewelry, if you are able to sell a piece three months, within three months since it's entered the store, it's considered a very fast moving. So on one hand, on one hand, um, it's a slow move turn industry, but at the same time, you know, if I want to attract more customer to, to enter my store, I need to constantly introduce new merchandise, freshness. Now, this is a huge challenge for the store. How can they introduce new merchandise and freshness when at the same time, it takes a long time to sell the merchandise? Eventually, your budget or your space will limit your ability to introduce new merchandise. How to create fresh display at a retailer in a highly slow turn industry? To address the challenge, some brands agree to take back, after some time, non-moving products. But then they say, look, uh, I'm willing to take back what you have not sold, but then we are not, you cannot exchange us one to one because otherwise I will not make money. So I'll take back, but then buy more from me. The entire discussions between the retailer and the brand is on the exchange terms. And that's the core fundamental conflict in their industry. Let's view this conflict. They want to have successful collaboration. Right? Both of them want to make money. For this, the store needs to keep freshness, new merchandise, without inflating inventory. This caused her to demand to exchange slow moving items, the one that they couldn't sell, to exchange them one to one. At the same time, from the brand perspective, the brand must protect its sales. If they just exchange one to one, they don't really sell more. So they say, I'm willing to take back, but you buy more. So let's go for exchange rate of two to one or three to one. And their entire discussions is on this arrow. What happens when you're not solving a core conflict and you just live with it? The core conflict, you know, it doesn't go away and you can swipe it under the carpet, but it's still there. And it makes your reality basically a reality where you constantly fight the symptoms resulting from the compromise, the compromise that the conflict generates. An unacceptable compromise is not a solution. We keep oscillating between the conflicting requirements dealing with fires caused by the compromise. UDI is a terminology in TOC that means undesirable effect. So let's see this UDIs from the both sides of this conflict. If we are tending to be on the exchange rate of one to one, then brand sales and profit drop, brand is under cash flow pressure, ability to introduce new design is limited, inventory and service levels are limited. If we move to the side of the brand and we start to exchange rate two to one or three to one, then the store dead stock is increasing store profitability erodes, store cash flow is stress, store ability to reorder is limited. Yeah, and there could be several compromises. For example, yes, I'm willing to exchange, the ones that I exchange one-to-one -one will have shorter payment terms, which obviously still hurt the cash of the store. Or only faster movers are exchanged one-to-one. I'll take back, but only the ones that I think I can sell in elsewhere, the ones that are selling more. Or exchange three-to-one, the store says, I'll take, okay, let's do three to one, but then I will order less quantity overall, which obviously is not so good, neither for the store nor for the brand. All these are examples of fires that we 
that are a result of unacceptable compromises. Again, if we want to exploit management attention, we need to understand that instead of dealing with the compromise of the conflict, we must find a way to break it. So a real solution should enable to satisfy both sides of the conflict, not just a, and not to leave the compromise. In this example, it means to keep freshness without inflating inventory and at the same time to protect sales. What did they decide to do? The brand said, let's have a new approach for collaboration. A store can exchange anything at any time, one to one, as long as it keeps constant amount of display or budget. So, for example, if you buy $50,000 worth of merchandise for me, you commit you keep this $50,000 of merchandise, but you can exchange anything at any time from my, whatever I have in my stock, in my, in, in my warehouse. So you are never stuck with an item that you cannot sell. At the same time, you need to keep maintaining this $50,000 dollars worth of merchandise which means if you're selling you need to reorder from me you cannot wait you have to keep this budget let's look at this approach in detail okay you gain access to the whole brand's multi-million dollar inventory i will not produce it especially for you but it's whatever i have in my inventory in my warehouse you can replace any item any day from the entire inventory and what I want in return is that you will hold constant amount of inventory throughout the year. Which means if you're selling, you need to reorder. Now point number five says reorder items are on us. You don't pay till you sell or at the end of the year after Christmas when you have enough cash. How would you like this collaboration? Of, store, of course, the store loved it. Why? Current practice. To sell more, you need more inventory. New practice, sell more with constant amount of inventory. Current practice, at best, dead stock items are removed after a year of blocking sales. New practice, snow moving items are replaced as early as identified, enabling more sales. Current practice, dead stock creates pressure on cash flow. New practice, no dead stock. Current practice, showcase a fragmented look, which means basically that if you, many times retailer, it's important for them to have the entire collection, the necklace, the bracelet, the ring, the earring, but the necklace costs a lot of money, so they don't order it. But now, since they can exchange any item any day, they will have the entire collection in the store. One inventory cycle, two to three inventory cycles. Of course, the store jumped at this solution. You may say that the brand is taking a big risk because they take back all the slow moving items, but you need to remember that in jewelry, the assortment level, the range is very, very wide. So many items that are slow moving in, in one store can be fast moving in another. Moreover, remember that the store can exchange only from what is in the warehouse. Not, it's not going to be produced especially for them. So if I have an item in my warehouse, it's actually a non-moving product. And if I replace a slow moving with this product that was in my warehouse, I didn't really increase my risk. I actually only enabled flow. Within one year, sales doubled. Again, to generalize, many times we're leaving a compromise. The result is constant battle of fires and oscillations, moving from one extreme side to the other of the conflict. If we want to exploit management attention, we need to understand what it is this core conflict and how to break it. Attention killer number three, focusing on targets, outputs, rather than building the enablers, the inputs. In order to explain what I mean by that, I will use an example where we are under pressure to meet sales targets. You see this comic where somebody is digging a hole and instead of getting out of the hole, he's continue digging it. And this, this illustration will really help me explain what I mean by just dealing with achieving targets instead of putting the enablers. In order to explain it, I will use an example from a company, a brand that produces meat pastry. And 
Uh, this meat pastry is sold in the category of what is called chilled products, off the shelf, wrapped in a plastic bag, like a sandwich, if you wish, and a consumer can take it off the shelf and eat it uh, chilled or put it in an oven for 20 minutes and it's becoming better quality. This brand had strong sales, everything was nice. Until several years ago, the retailers that sold this product decided to develop and launch a private label. Private label basically means a, a brand that is owned by the retailer, which is usually much cheaper than the um, original brand. When retailers decide to launch a private label which is similar to your product, you get what we call a double whammy. The first blow is that there is a cheaper product on the shelf next to your brand. Now, if, it, if this product is successful, you get the second blow. The retailer will come to you and say, look, if you want me to continue and sell your brand, you need to give me better margin. Now, that's what happened to this company. And as a result, they were under immense pressures to achieve their sales targets. And when you're only focusing on the targets and getting the numbers, you start taking distorted actions. Let's see these distorted actions and what they created. Addressing the market constraint by imposing sales targets drives distorted actions, right? We said that sales are dropping for the reasons I mentioned, the private label. This result in profit dropping. Now they're under pressure to improve their bottom line. They need to increase sales. What do they do? they started to give discounts to the retailers. Of course, they don't call it discounts. It's a bad word. They do promotions, which is a much nicer word. Okay, you do promotions and then profit is even more dropping. Now you're under pressure to reduce cost. They did, took two ac actions to deal with the cost pressure. First, they spend less on marketing. Then there was less brand awareness in the market and sales continue to drop. Second thing they said, okay, we have to reduce the cost of the product. Let's see if we can uh, take out some of the expensive ingredient. In their case, they decided that they can uh, sell the product with less meat inside. How did they know that the consumer will still buy the product even though it has less meat? The proof of them was the private label product that was next on the shelf that had less meat. So here's a proof. So they took out meat, they reduced the quality of the product, but this only made it similar to the private label, less differentiation, and sales are dropping. One of my father fam uh, favorite quotes was, when you are in a hole, first thing you do is you stop digging. When you're in a hole, stop digging. It sounds so trivial and so ridiculous, but many times that's exactly what happens to us. Instead of figure, figuring out how to get out of the hole, because of the short-term pressure, the actions we take only dig the hole further, like in this case. I don't have much time. I wanted to share with you some more example of digging the hole. In this slide, you see a red ocean. The ocean is red from competition, competitors eating each other, trying to fight for the demand out there. Nobody has real competitive edge. And then everybody under pressure to start floating, to, to try and get their head above water. And they start taking distorted actions, like doing these promotions. The, now I can show you more examples. We don't have the time to explain it. I'll just show it to you an example of short-term actions that many times just bite you later. Like, let's add more choices. Let's increase the variety of our products and offering to the market. But if this more variety is not really adding more sales, it starts to cannibalize each other and create slow-moving products and choice overload with consumers and sales and cost, sales will reduce, cost will increase. Accelerate new product introduction. Over customization of products. Over commit. Yes, I can do it in three weeks, no problem. Cutting cost service levels, reducing marketing budget. Re cutting research and development budget. Over standardization of products, the other side of the coin, reduce quality and so on. All of them are like trying to float with a paper boat on the red ocean. 
trying to deal with tar just meeting the targets instead of really looking at what can get you out of the hole. We don't have much time, so I will now talk very, very quickly. I'm sorry, and maybe it will be a subject of a next webinar, of one of our next web uh, webinars. If we want to get out of the hole in such cases, if we want to talk about the enabler in this case, it means that we have to find what type of real innovation our company can do to create a competitive edge, to really create ex exceptional value. It could be a product or service innovation or business model or offering innovation. Remember, I said at the beginning of our pres my presentation that exceptional value is created by removing a significant limitation for the customer in a way that was not possible before and to the extent that no significant competitor can deliver. The innovation process, the entire of the, the, this process must be geared to remove this limitation, the limitation of the customers. I have several examples here, but we don't have much time to go over it. I'll just use the first one. One of our customers in Japan is Omron Healthcare, and they developed a product many years ago, made them a giant company, which is blood pressure monitor device that you use at home in order to measure your blood pressure. This turn, turned them into a over $1 billion company. Obviously, it removes a significant limitation for many customers. What is the limitation? The limitation is that until we had this product, the only way to measure our blood pressure was to go to the doctor. A big limitation. First step, identify the significant limitations of your customers that you would like to be dedicated to dedicate your company to remove. Then construct powerful solutions to remove these limitations and effective business models to translate value into business. This is called the business innovation process. I will skip this uh, in the previous slide because we don't have much time and we will cover it in our next webinar. Actually, there are three phases here. Would the customer gain exceptional value? And there are many tools that we use in order to identify limitations in the marketplace. Would the customer make the change? How do we know that we will really adopt our innovation and get this value. And there are many tools that we're not gonna cover now to uh, exploit this value. And then how do we transform value into business? What is the bu right business model to follow? And there are tools in order to follow this, uh, to apply this business model, develop this business model. All of this is called the business innovation process of TOC, which will be the subject of one of our next webinar. To conclude, there are three, the ultimate constraint of any organization is management attention. Our ability to get results dealing with complexity, uncertainty, and conflicts. Exploiting management attention means that we are able to uh, provide exceptional value to our stakeholders. But in order for that, in order to be able to do it, we must address what we call the attention killers. And you need to just look at these and, decide, and figure out which one is the prevalent attention killer in my environment now. And how do, how do I figure out first what to stop doing? Okay, is it that I'm dealing with symptoms instead of addressing the vicious cycle, the core problem, or I'm not really solving a core conflict in my environment? or that I'm too bothered with targets rather than building the processes to achieve them. 